everybody. Welcome to today's um, edition of the Spectral Geometry in the Cloud seminar. Today, we're having uh, Andrea Mondino from University of Oxford, who will talk to us about optimal transport and quantitative geometric inequalities. Uh, as usual, if you have questions during the talk, you can either ask them in chat and we will relay them, or you can just unmute yourself and ask it. Please, so Andrea. The... Thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, sure, I can, I can just encourage questions if there are any, just a shout and uh, uh, or say, do something and uh, we'll try to uh, to get. All right, so okay. thanks for the um, invitation and for this opportunity. So the goal of the talk of today is to discuss some recent geometric uh, inequalities in uh, quantitative forms uh, for smooth and manifolds via tools of optimal transport. And um, more precisely, um, the tool that I'm going to use uh, come from uh, optimal transport for studying non-smooth spaces with lower bound on the Ricci curvature. In the last 15 years, there has been a surge of activity in uh, studying non-smooth spaces with lower bound on the Ricci curvature. Um, several techniques have been uh, developed for studying uh, such non-smooth spaces. And uh, several of these uh, new techniques uh, have been useful also to prove uh, new results uh, even in the smooth set. So today I will, I will give you a kind of a taste uh, of uh, some of these techniques, uh, how I've been uh, used. More precisely, I will talk about two uh, um, results. The first one is a quantitative version of Levigram of um, isoperimetric inequality joined with Cavalletti and Maggi. And the second one is a quantitative form of Obata rigidity theorem and is joined with Cavalletti and Semola. Let me start with a warm up about the isoperimetric problem. So, as you all know, this is one of the oldest problems in mathematics, having its roots in more than 2000 years ago. And, and the, say, the basic question in the isoperimetric problem is uh, the following We are given a space X, a volume V. And we ask, what is the minimal amount of boundary area needed to enclose uh, such a volume V? So of course, uh, when the space is the Euclidean space, is Rn, then we have the Euclidean as a parametric inequality, which tell us that uh, if we take any set of finite, of finite perimeter, or say with smooth boundary, it's uh, good as well, then you can bound the perimeter of the set from below with the perimeter of a round ball having the same volume as your set. The space is uh, the Euclidean sphere, so is the, is the round sphere of, say, of radius one. Uh, then you have an, an analogous statement, which is the spherical isoperimetric inequality, which tells that if you take any finite perimeter set inside the sphere, then you can bound from below the perimeter of the set with the perimeter of a metric ball inside the sphere having the same volume as the ball having the, the, the same volume as uh, the uh, set E. So a metric ball in uh, the sphere is nothing but a, a spherical cup. So you're, you're, you are just cutting a sphere with, uh, an, uh, with an affine plane. Okay, now in both of the examples, uh, both in the Euclidean and in the spherical as a parametric um, inequality, the space is fixed, is either the Euclidean uh, space or the sphere. And what happens is that such a, such a space contains a model subset, which is a metric ball. And what we do is we compare any subset of the space with such a model subset. All right, so this is the Azopani problem in his, in his say, most simple form. Say, besides the Euclidean isoperimetric inequality, probably the most famous one is the Levigromov isoperimetric inequality, which is more general in the sense that the space is not fixed anymore. So um, the, the space now is uh, any Riemannian manifold with the uh, Ricci curvature bounded below by n minus one, meaning, so what, 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 what does it mean that the Ricci curvature is bounded below by n minus one? It means so the Ricci tensor is a bilinear form, n, n minus one is a constant. So what I mean is that uh, all the eigenvalues, all the Ricci curvature are bounded below by n minus one, or equivalently uh, Ricci minus a minus one times the metric G is a, a non-negative definite bilinear form. You have a, a manifold with the reach point below by N minus one. You take a domain E with the smooth boundary or more generally a set of finite perimeter. Then you want to find a lower bound on the perimeter of this set E. So what you do now, you take a round sphere, unit radius. So why you choose the unit radius? Because you saturate the lower bound on the Ricci. So a sphere of radius one is a Ricci constant equal to n minus one. And inside such a sphere, you consider a metric ball 
such that methane ball has the same renormalized volume as E. What, what do I mean with the renormalized volume? I mean that I take the volume of, of the set E, I normalize it by the volume of the ambient space M, and I want this to be equal to the ratio between the volume of the metric ball over the volume of the sphere. Then the Levigram of isoperimetric inequality tells that we can bound from below the renormalized perimeter of the set E with the renormalized perimeter of the ball, where the renormalized perimeter is the perimeter of the set E divided by the volume of the ambient space M, and, and the normalized perimeter of the ball is the analogous object, so is the perimeter of the ball divided by the total volume of the top. You have a lower bound on the renormalized perimeter of any set inside a manifold with each point below by n minus one with the renormalized perimeter of a metric ball inside a sphere. And um, the sphere is, is, is chosen so that you saturate the lower bound on the rich. Okay, so this is the famous and beautiful Levigram of isoperimetric inequality. And let me just remark a couple of uh, key features of this uh, beautiful uh, inequality. So the first key feature is that uh, differently from uh, the Euclidean or the spherical isoperimetric uh, inequality, in the Levigram of uh, inequality, the space is not fixed. We are considering any subset inside any manifold with reach point below by n minus one. And what we are doing is we are comparing such the perimeter of uh, such a subset with a model subset, which is a spherical cup, inside a model space, which is a sphere. Second uh, observation, the Levirum of inequality is global in the space, in the sense that uh, in the Levirum of inequality, you are not seeing only the set E, but you're seeing also the complement of the set E. Why? Because in the left-hand side, you see that uh, you have the perimeter of the set, divided by the total volume of uh, the manifold M. So if you choose, so if you move the ambient space M even outside, very far from your set E, you don't change the perimeter, but you may affect its total volume. And so we are going to see in a minute uh, that this is indeed uh, giving some global information on the world space. But in order to get uh, the notation simpler, uh, later it is useful to introduce the isoperimetric uh, profile function. So as you all know, the isoperimetric uh, profile function. Now I uh, use it for all the normalized quantities since these are the ones which are relevant for the Levigram of uh, inequality. So I take any volume V between zero and one, and then the isoperimetric profile function of the manifold M is the infimum of the renormalized perimeter of all the sets, all the finite perimeter sets, having normalized volume equal to D. And since we are divided by the, by, the, by, the total, by the total volume of the manifold M, the normalized volume of any sets runs between zero and one. Just with this notation, the Levigram of inequality can be stated in a much more uh, say, simple form, just saying that given any manifold M with uh, of dimension N, and with the Ricci bounded below by n minus one, then you can bound from below the isoperimetric profile function of the manifold M with the isoperimetric profile of the sphere Sn for every volume between zero and one. This is exactly the same statement, just uh, compactified using the isoperimetric profile function. A couple of uh, uh, beautiful um, properties attached to the Levigram of inequality are the, rigid, are the rigidity statements. So um, the reality is an uh, answer to the question, what happens if uh, the equality in the Levigram of inequality is obtained? Okay. And the answer is that if there exists some set E inside the manifold M having non-trivial volume, so the volume is between zero and one strict, which achieves the equality in the Levigram of inequality, so the, per the normalized perimeter of the set is equal to the uh, profile function, hyperparametric profile of uh, the sphere at the right volume, then you have rigidity both in the space and in the set. In uh, the space, you have rigidity in the sense that your space M must be isometric to the round sphere, Sn. Rigidity in uh, the subset is that uh, the subset E must be isometric to a metric ball inside the sphere. 
Okay, so this is uh, really what I. So this is um, connected to what I was saying before about uh, the global property of the Levirum of inequality. Here, notice that uh, if the set E is very very tiny, is a, is, is a volume epsilon, but epsilon slightly bigger than uh, zero. If you achieve equality in, in the Levirum in the Levirum of inequality for just such a tiny uh, subset, then your space must be globally equal to um, to um, the sphere. Okay, and that's uh, because uh, you are basically uh, forcing the volume to be maximal of your of your of your space. So this is about the rigidity, and now what about stability? So the rigidity is answering to the question: What can I say if the equality is achieved in the inequality, and the stability in, instead uh, ad addresses the question, which is: uh, What can I say if the equality is almost achieved in the inequality? Is it true that the space must be close to the model space? And is it true that the subset must be close to the, to the model subset? Okay. So since we have just seen the, the rigidity, I will split this into two questions. So question one is if the Levigram of uh, if the equality in the Levigram of inequality is almost attained, what can I say on the manifold? Is the manifold close to a sphere? In which sense? In which topology? And, and, the, and the second question is, what can I say on the subset E, which is almost achieving equality in the Levigram of inequality? Is the subset close to a metric ball? In which sense, in which topology? All right, so let's start from question one. So question one was actually uh, addressed, uh, actually is, is, is a consequence of uh, a beautiful paper by Berard Besson Gallo in uh, Invenciones in the 80s, who proved the following beautiful statement. So they proved that, uh, if you have a manifold uh, with reachable and below by n minus one and with diameter, call it D, the, 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 the diameter, not, notice that uh, if the reaches and below by n minus one, then by Bonnemeyer's theorem, the diameter must be, cont must be uh, contained between zero and pi, okay, where, where pi is the diameter of a sphere. Then you always have a, a quantitative lower bound uh, on the ratio between the isoperimetric profile function of the manifold in the isoperimetric profile function of, of the sphere by an explicit uh, uh, formula. So you can bound this uh, ratio by the integral of uh, from zero to pi over two of the cosine to power n minus one over the integral of the same quantity up to d. Since d is between zero and pi, you see that the cosine is always strictly bigger than zero over in, in, uh, in this range. Uh, and so the numerator is always uh, larger than the denominator. And so you, you have that the left hand side is always uh, larger than, uh, so is, is always larger than one. Okay. And moreover, if you, if you look at uh, this, uh, at, at this uh, formula, you, you, you see that the only way the, the manifold uh, can have the same as a parametric uh, profile function of the sphere for some volume V, the only way is it. Is that also this ratio is equal to one, meaning that, that the diameter must be equal to pi. Okay? So this is saying that, 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 that uh, by the by, by uh, maximum diameter theorem of uh, Chang, it is telling you that, that the manifold must be equal to a round sphere. But it, but it is telling more. It is telling that if for some v, the left hand side, the ratio at the left hand side is, is close to one for some v, then the diameter must be close to pi in a quantitative sense. You really get an estimate on the, on the diameter, right? And so just by doing the computation, you can uh, any, any, any computation of uh, functions of uh, one variable, uh, you can check uh, that uh, given a fixed the, uh, dimension and the volume V for some, if for that V, the, um, Isoparametric uh, probability function of uh, the manifold is close to the isoparametric uh, probability function to the sphere with an error delta, then the diameter of the manifold must be close to pi in a quantitative uh, way. So with uh, an error delta to power one over n. So one can check that this delta to power one over n is sharp. Uh, so it, it is saying that uh, in some sense, uh, the space is uh, has some property which uh, makes it uh, close to the sphere because you know that the sphere is the only manifold of with Ricci bigger than n minus one of diameter equal to pi. And now we are saying that our space 
as diameter close to pi. It turns out that this is not strong enough to conclude that uh, the manifold is close to a round sphere, but uh, because um, it could be close to a non-smooth space with the diameter equal to pi. And this kind and, and these nozzle spaces with diameter equal to pi are called spherical suspensions. You can think of them as, as, as kind of rugby balls or uh, lemons. And um, indeed, it follows uh, from a beautiful uh, work by Chirin Holding uh, in the Annals uh, called Almost Maximal Diameter Theorem that uh, under this condition, from the fact that uh, the diameter is close to pi and the manifold is reachable below by n minus one then the manifold must be close to spherical suspension in Gromofardov sense. In Gromofardov topology, you can think of it as a kind of, uh, is, is weaker, it is a zero order uh, closeness of uh, the matrix. You can think of it as a kind of uh, slightly weaker um, closeness in C0 of the distances, okay? It is weaker than C0, but in a first approximation, we can think of that of an infinity closeness at uh, mm, not too small scales. So the space must, must be closed. So if the if the equality is almost attained in the levi of um, inequality, then the space must be close to a spherical suspension. And a spherical suspension is a kind of non-smooth analog of a sphere in the, in, uh, the sense that is a, uh, a non-smooth space with each point below by n, um, n uh, minus one and uh, diameter equal to pi. So this answers the question one. And now, what about question two? So question two was, uh, what can I say on the subset if um, the um, if the uh, uh, if, if it has almost uh, optimal perimeter in the in the in the Levy room of isoperimetric um, inequality? So in order to get a feeling of the problem, probably it is um, useful to first start from the uh, more classical. Euclidean and the spherical isoperimetric inequalities and, and see what are the answers in, in those settings. Settings, question two, amounts to the so-called quantitative Euclidean isoperimetric inequality. But this was uh, uh, say the, the sharp, say the full solution was given uh, by Fusco, Maggi and Pratelli in a paper in the Annals in 2008 after previous works that I uh, don't mention. And a statement is um, the following. We are in the n-dimensional Euclidean space. So th there exists a constant depending only on the dimension, such that for every subset E in Rn, there exists a round ball optimally centered with respect to E and having the same volume as E, such that volume of the symmetric difference between the set and the ball normalized by the volume of the set is bounded above by the dimensional constant times the so-called um, isoperimetric deficit. So in the right-hand side, we have the ratio between the perimeter of the set divided by, by the perimeter of, of the ball minus one to power one over two, to power one half. So how to interpret this um, uh, result? All right. so. Let's look at the left at the right hand side. So the, the right hand side, say if the set is achieving the equality in the uh, Euclidean isoperimetric inequality, then it has the same perimeter as the ball. So the right hand side is equal to zero. And then the left hand side must be equal to zero as well, which 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 means that the volume of, of the symmetric difference of E and the, the ball is zero, which means that up to a set of measure zero, E is equal to a ball. Okay, so we are uh, recovering the Euclidean, say the rigidity in the, in the, in the Euclidean isoperimetric inequality. But, as, uh, but this is much stronger because this is saying that uh, if the right hand side is small, meaning that uh, the perimeter of the set E is uh, close to achieve equality in the Euclidean uh, isoperimetric um, inequality, then the volume of the symmetric difference between E and the ball must be small, and small, how much small? This can be quantified with the right-hand side. Okay, so this is why it is called the quantitative uh, Euclidean isoperimetric uh, inequality. So the proof of Fusco, Maggi, and Pratelli goes via a kind of quantitative symmetrization. So basically, 
very roughly, the idea is that uh, one takes the uh, proof of the uh, Euclidean hyperparametric inequality via Schwarz symmetrization and uh, quantify this proof. The, the, um, since it is such a beautiful uh, result, there have been uh, ad, um, other, other proofs. And the alternative proofs have been done either via L2 optimal transport using the Brainy map in L2 optimal transport. And, and, and this was done by Figali, Maggi, and Fratelli in a paper in the mentioned in 2010. And then th there's been another approach via regular, via regular theory and selection principle by Cicalese and Leonardi uh, in ARMA 2012. It was about the Euclidean isoperimetric inequality. Now, what about the spherical isoperimetric inequality? This was uh, uh, done by Bogelein, Dutra, and Fusco in a paper in advance in, in, in Calvary in 2015. And basically, they proved the analogous statement for the sphere. What, what uh, they proved is that for every volume V between 0 and 1 and every uh, dimension N, there exists a constant which depends on the dimension and on the volume V with the following property. Take any subset E inside the, the sphere, say your final parameter, having renormalized volume equal to V, then there exists an optimally centered metric ball B in the sphere, having the same volume as uh, your set B, and such that uh, now you estimate the volume of the symmetric difference of the set E and uh, the ball with what? With the um, isoperimetric deficit in the sphere. So in the, in the right hand side, you have the ratio between the um, normalized perimeter of the set E minus the uh, isoperimetric profile function of the sphere. And, and again, uh, if the right hand side is equal to zero, it means that the set is achieving equality in the uh, in the spherical isoparametric inequality, and this forces the set to be equal to a ball up to up to a set of measure zero. And and uh, this estimate is quantifying how far is a set from a ball, knowing that it almost achieves equality in the uh, spherical isoparametric inequality. And uh, the proof of uh, these uh, results goes along the same lines of Cicalese and Donardi selection principle, which turns out to be a very, uh, say, elastic uh, tool, very flexible. And indeed, uh, it, it has been useful, say, this Cicalese and the Leonardi approach have been useful also for studying clusters in, uh, in the, in the isoparameter problems and also in. So, this is about uh, the Euclidean and the spherical isoparametric inequality. So, what about the Levy Gromov inequality? So, let me say that the above um, quantitative results are for either ambient space equal to the Euclidean space or the sphere. So, is in a fixed space. And such a fixed space is the highest possible degree of symmetry. So, we know that. If a manifold has the same degree of uh, symmetry as the round sphere or Rn, it is either Rn or the sphere of the or the or the or the hyperbolic space. The Levigram of um, inequality is for much more general manifolds. So they are is for manifold without any uh, symmetry, just knowing that the uh, reach is bounded below by n minus one. And so the above approaches uh, seems not to be applicable. Say the symmetrization, uh, which is approached by Fusco, Maggi, and the Pratelli, is, so the, the basic um, idea is uh, using the, the, the fact that the ambient space is a very large isometric group, isometric group, one slices the, the set with hyperplanes and then moves uh, around slices using uh, the isometric group. And uh, if you are in a general Riemann manifold, this has not much hope to be, uh, to be carried on. So the Brenya map, the, so the L2 optimal um, transport um, approach of Figali, Maggi, and Pratelli was very well in Rn, but already in the sphere, it seems to be an open problem to prove the spherical isoparametric inequality using the Brenya map uh, approach. So uh, even more challenging in a general manifold with lower bound on the uh, reach. And uh, the selection principle by Cicalese and uh, Leonardi is probably the most flexible uh, approach, but uh, it uh, uses heavily uh, regularity theory and smooth convergence. And um, say, 
setting of manifold below bound on the Ricci curvature, the natural notion of convergence is a form of outer convergence, not smooth convergence. And so this seems to be a quite a, say, quite a, say, a hard step in order to implement this uh, regularity theory approach. So what we do, so we use a different uh, approach based on optimal transport, but based on L1 optimal transport and not L2 optimal transport. Say, detail in uh, a moment, and this is called, uh, this kind of um, approach is called localization method. So this localization method, let me just give a, a brief history of this localization method. So this localization, this localization technique is um, a way to reduce an a priori complicated high dimensional problem to a family of simpler one dimensional problems. Okay, so how one does it? So typically, so it was done uh, first in uh, when the ambient space is Rn or Sn using the high symmetry of uh, the space. And one can obtain this dimension reduction by iterative bisections. So this was uh, done uh, first, uh, the, the first paper that I know where this was performed is a paper by Pine and by Berger in the 60s about uh, the sharp estimate on the first eigenvalue of the Neumann Laplacian in compact convex sets in Rn. It's very much in the flavor of this uh, seminar. So it is really about eigenvalue problems, uh, spectral geometry. And, uh, and then it was formalized by Gromov and Vitaly Milman uh, in Kanan Lovat and, and Simonovitz uh, in the 80s and in the 90s. The idea is that you start from a problem, but you want to prove some uh, inequality, and you observe that uh, this inequality is uh, unchanged if you bisect uh, your space. So you bisect the space and uh, you say, well, if I'm able to prove my inequality for each of the, of the two halves, then I get the inequality in uh, the you can do it for the uh, Neumann Laplacian on a, on a compact, on a compact co convex set because you start with a, uh, with a function of a null mean value, then you find a hyperplane which uh, preserves the, the null mean value property on both, uh, on, on both uh, sides. And then cutting a convex set by a hyperplane gives you a convex set. And so all your properties are uh, preserved. And you want that if you're able to prove the inequality in each of the two halves, then you get the inequality on the on, on the big on the on dual convex set. So you bisect once, and then you say, well, now I bisect another time for each of the two halves. I go on, go on, go on, and after uh, a, a, after count after countably many times, you see that you reduce the dimension by one. Then you go on, go on, go on again, um, countably many times. You reduced by another one the dimension until you arrive to a space of dimension one with the weighted measure. And then you can solve this problem by hands. Basically. This is what uh, uh, Pan and, and Weinberger did. And the formalization of, uh, of Gromov, Vitaly Milman, and Kanan, Lomatz, and Simonovitz works well in Rn, in Sn, in Hilbert spaces, and every time that you have uh, um, enough symmetries of uh, your space. Then it, there was a, a breakthrough by Boaz Clartag in 2014 was able to generalize uh, such a um, localization technique to remind manifolds without uh, any symmetry assumption and using L1 optimal transport. So his uh, approach has the great advantage of not, of not assuming symmetry, but still uses uh, the smoothness of the space because basically he's uh, using L1 optimal transport to um, partition the space in uh, geodesics and then he wants to show that uh, the uh, that the that the weighted measure on each of the geodesics has the CDKN condition, and how he does it basically uh, it follows the approach, say the the um, the computation of einstein karcher if you know it. So in, these are very much smooth computations, just based on the estimates of the final form and the best set of, of the Cantorovich potential. So what uh, uh, I've done with the Cavalletti is to uh, extend such an L1 optimal transport uh, approach uh, to localization to non-smooth spaces. Uh, and uh, when you are in the non-smooth setting, uh, you cannot do some computations. And so we had to find, the, say, uh, shorter ways of uh, doing things. And so the paper is also, say, uh, more compact than the original Riemannian paper. So this is a, a brief history of the localization. So now uh, with this... Uh, with, with such a location uh, technique, we have been able to prove a quantitative form of the Levi-Gromov inequality. 
So how drip reader? So this is joint this is joint work with Cavaletti and Maggi, uh, published in Chipan. And the statement is as follows: any volume between zero and one and fix any dimension b or, b or equal to n two. Then there exists a constant which depends on the dimension and on the volume with the following properties. Let m be an n-dimensional manifold with reach point below by n minus one, and consider any set of finite parameter e inside m having normalized volume equal to v. And there exists a metric ball b inside the manifold having the same volume as set e, and such that the following estimate holds. So this is saying that at the left hand side we have the symmetric difference between e and the ball. And on the right hand side, we have the difference between the perimeter of the, of the set, so the, the premise perimeter of the set, and the isoparametric profile of the sphere. And in particular, if the set E is an, is an isoparametric subset with normalized volume equal to V, then you can bound the uh, symmetric difference, the volume of the symmetric difference between the set E and the uh, ball with such a constant. And here you have the difference of the isoparametric profile of the manifold and of the sphere at the volume where the set is an isoparametric set. Excuse me, okay. Andrea, what does it mean that E is an isoparametric subset? It means that it is it, that uh, the perimeter of E is equal to the isoparametric profile function of the manifold at the volume V. So it, it, it means that it is uh, minimizing the perimeter of uh, uh, among all sets uh, in the manifold with the same volume as the set E. So how to read this, uh, this uh, result? So it, it is saying that if uh, a set E inside the manifold, now we have a manifold, which is not the sphere, a priori just a manifold with lower bound on the reach by N minus one. Okay, so you have the, you have the Levirum of, uh, inequality, which is telling you that the perimeter of this set is bounded below by uh, the isoparametric uh, profile function of the sphere at the volume V, which is the volume of uh, the set. But now what this statement is saying is saying that if the perimeter of the set is close to, to the perimeter, to, to, the, to, to the model one, to the, to, to the optimal one in the sphere, then there exists a ball inside the manifold such that the, uh, the set E is close to the ball in L1 sense, so in, uh, in volume. And what, is the, and what is the challenge here is that comparing uh, this statement with the quantitative Euclidean and the quantitative spherical um, as a parametric uh, inequalities. So here, the set E is a subset in the manifold. And what we are doing is we are comparing the perimeter of, of uh, the set with something not living in the manifold, but of something in another space. We are comparing it with the isoparametric profile function of the sphere, not of the manifold itself. So with a kind of Levigram of isoparametric deficit. So this left-hand side is completely living in the manifold. So we have a ball in the manifold and a set in the manifold. And you're saying that they are small, that, that, that they are close in volume sense, if the perimeter of the set is close to something in the sphere. Okay, so the, the challenge here is to make speak the manifold with the, the sphere, because we have these two spaces which are interplay. And how we do that? We do that with the right. So mm, I stated the uh, result, uh, both say the quantitative version of the, uh, on the uh, set and on the space. So theorem one was the one of Brad Song Gallo saying that uh, if, uh, the um, if the equality is almost achieved in the in the Levirum of inequality, then the diameter is the is almost pi. Okay, so this was I I for the moment I stated everything just for smoothly man manifolds with lower bound on the Ricci by n minus one, but let me stress that we prove everything in the much more general framework of possibly non smooth spaces with the lower bound on the Ricci in terms of optimal transport. So these are the so-called uh, essentially non-branching CD and minus one N mathematical spaces. So instead of uh, say giving the, the definition and, and, and entering uh, the, the technicality, let me just mention that these are possibly non-smooth uh, spaces of uh, dimension bounded above by N 
and the reaching point below by n minus one in a synthetic sense via optimal transport in the sense of log term VLAN. And instead of giving you a definition, let me just give you a list of remarkable examples entering into this framework other than smooth MM manifold with lower bound on the reach. So such a class contain weighted manifolds, uh, smooth manifolds with a measure which is ob obtained by multiplying the volume measure of the uh, manifold by a weight. Then you build up a new tensor out of that, which is a modification of the uh, rich tensor called Bakri Emery rich tensor. And if this and if this tensor is bound below by n minus one, then you are in the framework of the Bakri Emery CD n minus one n spaces, which enter into this framework of the CD n minus one n method measure space. They are still smooth, but with the weighted measure. And no smooth spaces entering into this framework, which are very well studied, are measured from a out of limits of Riemannian manifolds of dimension n and with the reach equal to bound below by n minus one. These are, this is the, uh, say the celebrated class of rich limit spaces of uh, Chigar coding. And uh, this class of uh, rich limits are uh, entering to the class of the so-called RCD n minus one n spaces, in turn entering into the class of essential branching CD n minus one n uh, spaces. So just to tell you that say, uh, you have a kind of, of, of hierarchy of uh, normal spaces, and uh, but all of them enter into this framework uh, where these results are proved. Okay, another class of normal spaces which enter into this framework are uh, Alexander spaces uh, of fine dimension and with each quarter and with the sectional quarter bound below by uh, one. So these are metric spaces which uh, satisfy uh, sectional quarter bound below by one in terms of uh, comparison triangles a la uh, Toponog of uh, theorem, and they also enter into this framework. And if you're interested in uh, kind of say Fizzer geometry, meaning uh, you have a smooth manifold and you endow the uh, tangent space with a norm instead of a scalar product, then you have a Fizzer manifold. There's a notion also there of uh, uh, lower bound on the uh, Ricci, there are many words, for instance, by Ota. Um, and uh, if uh, uh, if you satisfy uh, Ricci bound below by n minus one in, in the sense of uh, manifolds, then uh, you, are, you also enter into this framework. Okay, so a lot of uh, examples enter into this framework apart from uh, lower bound uh, Ricci and uh, smooth uh, uh, manifolds. All the results that I mentioned up to now are proved into this framework, but I mentioned them for smooth manifolds because, I mean, it is just uh, they were new for smooth manifolds, and uh, it's, it's already a interesting enough framework for for inputs. So this finishes the first part um, about uh, the quantitative Levi-Gromov. Now, uh, since uh, uh, it's a, uh, it's a seminar about uh, uh, spectral geometry, let me say something about uh, uh, some spectral qualities. Okay, and let me talk about uh, a quantitative version of Obata T. So uh, let me start. Uh, from uh, something that uh, say this audience knows very well, which is the Lichnerowitz uh, spectral gap. The Lichnerowitz spectral gap says the following. So you have an n-dimensional manifold, remaining manifold with h point below by n minus one, and fix a Lipschitz function f on the manifold with uh, null mean value. Then you can bound from above the L2 norm squared of the function with one over n the Dirichlet energy of uh, the function. So how, it, of course, one can, in, one can interpret this uh, Poincaré inequality in terms of a spectral gap. And how? Well, because say the, the first non-zero eigenvalue for the Neumann Laplacian is, by definition, the infimum of the Dirichlet energy among all functions with L2 norm equal to one and with null mean value. So, uh, just with uh, just reading uh, the uh, this po the Poincaré inequality in the first line in terms of uh, lambda one, uh, one can restate it by saying that uh, given an n-dimensional manifold with, with rich point below by n minus one, then the first eigenvalue, first non-zero Neumann eigenvalue of the manifold, is bounded below by n, which is when you compute it is exactly the first. Uh, again, value on the round sphere. Okay, so uh, 
uh, Richie Pelle below by n minus one forces the first um, eigenvalue of the Neumann Laplacian to be at least the one of the of the round sphere. So this is a comparison result due to the Knerovitz, and uh, say in the same uh, say uh, line of uh, uh, discussion as for the uh, isoparametric inequality, we can ask about uh, the rigidity and stability questions. So the, the rigidity was uh, settled by Obata back in 62, and he proved this uh, beautiful statement saying that uh, uh, if the equality is achieved in the Lichnerowitz uh, in, in the inequality, then the manifold must be isometric to the round sphere. So if the first eigenvalue of the manifold is equal to n, and the Ricci and the, and the Ricci is bounded below by n minus one, then the manifold is isometric to the sphere. And then note that uh, on the sphere you also know who are the first uh, eigenfunctions. So these are exactly the cosine of the distance function from a given point on the manifold. So you, you, you fix any point on the sphere, you take the cosine of the distance function from this point, and then you, then you, 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 you get that this function is a first eigenfunction on the sphere. So you have plenty of first eigenfunctions on the sphere. And then you just put this constant square root of n plus one to normalize to have it uh, L2 norm equal to one. This is about the rigidity. And now what about stability? So stability means again, so what uh, happens if uh, the first again value of the manifold is close to n, which is the one on the round sphere? So first uh, uh, addressed by Cheng and Croke, who proved in a non, who proved a non-quantitative statement uh, saying that if uh, the first again value is close to n, well, this is equivalent to say that the diameter must be close to pi, but without uh, quantification, just ep epsilon and delta statement. And, uh, a quantitative statement was given by Berar by Berabeson Gallo in the same paper that I mentioned before, who proved that uh, if the first eigenvalue is close to n, then the diameter of the manifold is almost, is almost maximal, is almost uh, equal to pi in a quantitative, uh, with, with a quantitative uh, Inequality. Uh, Bertrand, uh, more recently, in 2007, in 2007, he proved the stability of eigenfunctions. So he proved that uh, uh, if, a, uh, if you have an eigenfunction uh, which uh, uh, has a, a corresponding eigenvalue uh, close to n, then this eigenfunction must be close in an infinity norm to the cosine of the distance function from some point. You have that on the sphere, the, uh, the eigenfunctions are exactly uh, cosine of, of distance functions. And uh, what Bethan proved is that if uh, the manifold has uh, uh, first eigenvalue close to n, then all the eigenfunctions will be close to uh, cosine of, of, of distance functions. But a quantitative. Let me, so a question that uh, we were interested in is, uh, can, we make, can we make quantitative? Uh, such result of uh, Bertrand, and can we generalize it to uh, functions with uh, almost optimal Rayleigh quotients uh, and also in non-smooth spaces? Uh, the question is, if I have a non-smooth space with lower bound on the Ricci, and if I have uh, a Lipschitz function with L2 norm equal to one and uh, null mean value, I know only that uh, the Dirichlet energy of the function is close to n. So this function is is, is not an eigenfunction, it's just a very, very small um, 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 L2 norm of the, of the Dirichlet energy, so the quotient. So is it true that my function must be close to the cosine of distance function for a certain pole? Okay. And the, the, the difference is that, uh, say, in this result here, we, have a, we are assuming that the function is, is an eigenfunction, and once you know that the function is an eigenfunction, you can, this function, we satisfy a PD, which is Laplacian of the function equal to lambda function. This, uh, this, uh, this PD is, uh, is elliptic. You can play with the maximum principle. You can get uh, Cheng Yao gradient estimates. And uh, from that, you can boost up and boost. If you do not know that your function is, is an eigenfunction, and you, uh, then you cannot apply such a maximum principle. And the challenge is uh, to just use uh, energy methods, just knowing that the energy of your function is uh, close to n, is almost minimal, in, or, in order to say something on, uh, on its shape, saying that 
it is close to the cosine of distance function. So this was the question. And uh, the answer is uh, uh, this statement, uh, which is a theorem proved in collaboration with the Cavalletti and Semola, uh, just published in, in nice and PDs. So uh, fix a, a dimension n, then there exists a constant, which depends only on the, the, on the uh, dimension with the following property. Either any manifold m with, of dimension n and with the Ricci curvature bounded below by n minus one, for every Lipschitz function f, null mean value, and with L2 norm equal to one, there exists a pole x in the manifold M, such that we can bound the L2 difference between the function and the cosine of this function from that pole with the difference between the Dirichlet energy of the function and N. Okay. So this is saying that without knowing that the function is an eigenfunction, just knowing that such a function as the almost minimal Dirichlet the energy, then the function must be close in L2 sense to the cosine of this function from a, uh, from a good pole. And in particular, of course, if the function is, a, is an eigenfunction, then uh, one can bound the L2 norm between uh, the L2 difference between F and the cosine of this function with the, the difference between the eigenvalue, the, the first eigenvalue of the manifold and the first eigenvalue of the sphere, just because the L2 norm squared is equal to the first eigenvalue. And again, uh, I studied it for simplicity for uh, smooth -man manifolds, but actually we proved it uh, for these non spaces uh, with lower bound on the Ricci. So on essentially non-branching CD and minus one N spaces. So in the last few minutes, I would like to give you a, um, very brief uh, account of the ideas involved in, in the proof, and more specifically, what is uh, this uh, um, localization via L1 optimal transport. I will not have time to, of course, to, 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 to give a proof of the quantitative versions, but I just would like to give you a taste of some of the ideas which are involved. Okay, so what is this uh, um, one dimensional localization? So the basic idea is uh, to find a way of uh, partitioning your space into one dimensional objects, which are actually geodesics, such that on each of these one dimensional objects, you have a, you endow it with a, a measure, which is a weight, which will, which is going to be a kind of a weighted measure with respect to the, uh, say, the big one uh, on the geodesic. And in such a way that uh, each one of these geodesics with the weighted measure are CDK and spaces in the sense that they have the same curvature dimension properties as the ambient space when you look at them in a synthetic sense. Okay, so this is because when you have a smooth manifold and you multiply the volume measure by a weight, then you change uh, its properties from the point of view of uh, Ricci curvature and uh, um, and uh, say uh, functional inequalities. And it turns out that if the n bacriemery which tends is bounded below by some constant, then uh, such a weighted space behaves like a, an n dimensional space with reach bounded below by k. Okay, so changing the, uh, the volume measure changes uh, the Ricci curvature as perceived by uh, functional and geometric inequalities. Okay, so this is the, uh, the basic idea. So more in practice, what is a one-dimensional localization? So we have a, uh, we have a space. Uh, so if you are not familiar with metamedial spaces, so XDM, XD is a metric space, M is a, uh, say is a probability measure over, over it. If you're, not, if you're not familiar with this framework, just think of a, of a Riemannian manifold and though with the Riemannian distance and there's a volume and there's measure M, you take the volume measure of the manifold and you normalize it by the total volume of the space. So to make it uh, a probability measure, assuming that your manifold is compact. Now you fix a set E inside X and uh, I want to find a localization with respect to, to the set E. So what is a localization? A localization is a partition of the space X into uh, subsets X alpha. So alpha is the index of the partition and the Q is uh, the uh, set 
or where, where the indices are taking values. It has nothing to do with rational numbers. It's just Q is just a bad name. It's just a, so we, we ask that, that, this, that this X alpha is an essential partition of, 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 of X, meaning that um, they are all disjoint and they cover X up to a set of measures. If you have a partition of the space X, then you can uh, have an associated partition of the measure M, which is called uh, this integration of the manifold. And you can think of it as a kind of non-straight Fubini uh, theorem. So if your space is, uh, say, the, the square zero one, and uh, your disintegration and your partition is made of vertical segments, then uh, you can just use Fubini to disintegrate the measure M, the, the, the measure M, which is the Lebesgue two on the square, and as integral of the Lebesgue one on the vertical segments with respect to the uh, Lebesgue one on the uh, on on uh, zero one. For general framework, what what does it mean? It it, uh, it means that we can write the volume measure M as an integral over the set of indices of measures M alpha. Each measure each each measure M alpha is uh, concentrated over the uh, element X alpha of the partition. It is still a probability measure. And then what you do, you integrate these measures M alpha with respect to a, with respect to a shootable uh, measure defined over the set of indices. A bit of uh, Fubini theorem. Now, uh, these, these two properties are very mild. So then uh, I'm asking something which is uh, key and much stronger, much harder to be proved, which is that uh, each X alpha is a geodesic in, in, uh, in X. And when I endow the space X alpha with the measure M alpha, this is a one dimensional space, it's a geodesic, but with a weighted measure. And I ask that, uh, that this space with this weighted measure is a CDK in space. So mean that topologically it is one dimensional, but as a metric measure space, it behaves like an n-dimensional space with each equal to band below by k. So it has exactly the same geometric properties from the point of view of functional inequalities as the MS space I started with, but with the big advantage that now it is one dimension. And then the, the fourth property, which is also key, is that uh, it, 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 how this partition is related to the set E. So this partition is related to, to the set E in this, in, this, uh, in this way. So each element of the partition is intersecting E with the sets of all the same measure and, 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 and all the intersection as the same measure as E, okay? So the measure M alpha of E intersected with the uh, element of the partition X alpha is equal to the volume of E. How to obtain this uh, localization? just in two words. So the basic idea is to do uh, optimal transport between E and its complement using as a, uh, using it as a cost for the optimal transport, the distance function to power one. And now the this optimal transport will be performed along geodesics, which correspond to integral curves of the uh, minus the gradient of the Cantorovich potential. And uh, these geodesics, which are, performing this, the, which are performing this optimal transport, form this partition. Okay, so these are so this partition is made by these geodesics, and you see how uh, this is driven by the by, by the set E because if I change the set E, uh, also the optimal transport between E and its complement will uh, change, and so also, also this partition will change. So this I want to skip it. I don't have time. So now I want to tell you how to use uh, this uh, uh, optimal, this uh, um, one-dimensional localization to prove the levy of uh, inequality. So proving the levy of inequality with this uh, approach is the zero step in order to then get a quantitative uh, statement. So the, the first step is to get a proof, and then you want to quantify this proof. So I will not have time to quantify the to quantify the proof, but let, let me just give you in one slide the proof of the levy of um, inequality with this uh, dimension um, reduction method, just for you to having a to get a flavor of uh, uh, this technique. Okay, so we want to prove we start from a space with lower bound on the Ricci by n minus one end of dimension n. We uh, fix a subset e inside x. And we want to find a lower bound on the perimeter of this set. 
Instead of working with the perimeter, let me work for simplicity with the outer microscopic content. One can give a proof also for a perimeter, but it is slightly longer. So let, for simplicity, let me stick to the outer microscopic content, which by definition is this right-hand side. So is the limit for epsilon going to zero of the volume of the epsilon enlargement of the set minus the volume of the set divided by epsilon. So here, what you're doing is you are taking the epsilon to brand neck brood of your set. You take its volume, you divide it by epsilon, and then you let epsilon go to zero. If the, if the set is smooth in Rn, you can check that this, that this converges to the um, n minus one uh, volume measure of the boundary of the set. Now we want to prove a lower bound of, of, uh, of it. So we, we know that the measure M can be disintegrated. So the measure M can be written as integral over the set of indices Q of this measures M alpha. So I replace each M with integral over Q of M. Of M. I use uh, Fatou lemma to bring the, the limit inside. And uh, by Fatou, I go down, but I'm still happy because uh, I just want a lower bound on the perimeter. Okay, so I, I bring the limit inside. And then I remember that uh, each measure M alpha was concentrated on the element of the partition X alpha. So I don't lose and I don't gain anything if I intersect each the elements here, E epsilon and E with X alpha. That's because M, M, M alpha is only seeing X alpha. Now it is a one line computation uh, exercise in uh, set theory to observe that uh, if you consider E, you intersect it with X alpha, you take the epsilon enlargement and you intersect it with X alpha ag again, well, this set is always contained in you, in, you, in, you enlarge E and then you intersect with X alpha, so just because this set is contained here. Now, since this set, this right-hand side is contained in the left-hand side, I can replace this guy with the smaller guy and I go down. And then I uh, copy the rest. I go down, but I'm, I'm still happy because I just want a lower bound. Now we now a, a key point. Now observe that uh, what is inside the uh, integral here is uh, nothing but is all living on X alpha. So is exactly the definition of the outer Minkowski content of E intersected with the ray X alpha. This is just an observation, but it's key. Because now why this is key? Because you now at this stage, you reduced the proof of proving uh, the levy of inequality for an n-dimensional set to prove an, an, uh, an isopermetric inequality for a set contained on a segment on, on X alpha. So you reduced an n-dimensional problem to a family of one-dimensional problems. This is how the one-dimensional localization works. Okay, so all these elements, all these sets intersected with the X alpha are all subset of X alpha, which is a segment, is a, is a, is a geodesic, with respect to a weighted measure M alpha. Okay, but now a key point is that uh, this measure M alpha satisfies the CD, the CD and minus one N condition. So now, uh, we are on a on a segment with a, with a, with a weight. We can easily we can easily have the uh, one dimensional uh, uh, of inequality for weighted measures, and so we can lower bound this uh, uh, one dimensional uh, perimeter with the as a parametric profile of the sphere weighted on the measure of this uh, intersection of the interact with the x alpha. Now we remember that all these measures. All the measure of the intersection of E with the array have all the same volume, which is the volume of the set uh, E, the original one. And now, since uh, this is not anymore depending on, uh, on alpha, and since Q was a, was a probability measure, we can just take this out. Q of uh, the measure Q is, uh, is, is one. And so we get uh, uh, that we can lower bound the uh, auditory content of E with the uh, isoparametric profile function of the sphere evaluated at the measure, at the measure of it. So this is this this is this is uh, in how one proves the theorem of inequality using uh, this uh, localization and then in order to prove the quantitative versions one has to quantify uh, this proof. And since I'm already uh, 5 minutes um, over time 
I thank you for your attention and I stop there. Thank you very much, Andrea. Um, we, we now have uh, time for questions. So as usual, if you have questions, please um, either write them on the chat or just unmute yourself and go ahead and ask your... I have a, a general question myself. Sure. Do, do you know what is the scope of application of such techniques? I mean, now it is for, uh, I don't know, Obata theorem for lambda one of the Laplacian in some context, but do, do you expect that uh, similar results could be obtained for many different problems uh, in the spectral world, I mean? So um, anytime, all right. So anytime that you can, um, so I think it's a, uh, generally these techniques work well. Anytime that you have a, uh, an inequality, which uh, uh, subject to one interval constraint. So uh, it works well for the algebraic problem because basically your interval constraint is uh, the volume of your set. It works well for uh, the Obata because uh, you, the, the interval constraint is uh, the is that the is that uh, the um, uh, the average of your function is say your, that your function has a null mean value. And um, so in order to, to, to get more, more say, spectral uh, uh, consequences, one would need to bootstrap the method, I guess, say, one can already get probably more uh, applications out of this. Uh, but with this technique, it is, as, it, as it is now, it works just with the one interval constraint. In order to, um, to apply this technique to higher order, um, uh, values, one would need to uh, refine the technique to uh, handle uh, more interval constraints because usually by the Raleigh quotient, uh, say you want to be orthogonal to the first again function, etc. So this is uh, challenging, and there are some results in this direction by uh, Christoph Chosmak um, because, say, uh, you know, proposed so there, are a, there are a series of uh, conjecture on this uh, on this topic by Clartag, and uh, Christoph Chosmak uh, has been able to, uh, to, to to investigate and give some uh, affirmative and negative uh, answer to uh, some of these uh, conjectures. Uh, we are still not yet at the, um, say, say the technique is not yet so powerful to fully manage uh, several internal constraints, but there are some, some work in progress and some good, uh, say, uh, works in that direction. Anyone, anyone else wants to ask something? So, so I, I, I guess, again, in, in, in the scope of application, um, so I, I understand that, that the curvature bounds that, that you use um, are, are because you want to compare to the model space being, right. being a sphere, right? Uh, That's correct. But, do you find, are, are, are there some sort of, of, of uh, similar type of inequalities that you can obtain with different model spaces, say in negative curvature or in flat spaces? Uh, I mean, flat spaces are usually in the case, I guess, but yeah. in, in, in say negative curvature. For negative curvature, uh, you can uh, do the same game. Um, once you uh, give an upper bound on the diameter. Okay. okay. So, um, of course, because say if you don't if you do not have a, a, an upper bound on the diameter, then uh, for, you know, for the isoparametric problem, your um, model uh, just becomes zero. So you, you say the lower bound uh, uh, stabilizes because you can always, uh, for instance, in R in R two, you can build some very very long strips, and there the isoparametric problem there uh, if the strip is very thin. The isoparametric uh, uh, quantity is, is the is the width of the strip, and then you can make the strip as uh, thin as you like, and so you you, you, don't, you don't get anything. And you can do the same in the hyperbolic space. So uh, the answer is that uh, you can do something also with curvature zero and negative curvature under the assumption that your space is an upper bound on the on the on the on the, on the diameter. And uh, this upper bound on the diameter will show up uh, in uh, your estimates. So, for instance, yeah. in the isoparametric problem, you will uh, have uh, a, a, a. And actually, so this was understood in the smooth setting by uh, Emmanuel Milman. Uh, it's a paper in uh, Journal of the, Ome of the European Math Society. So, he detected uh, the, um, the model isoparametric uh, profile functions for uh, uh, Ricci curvature 
bigger or equal than a negative constant and uh, uh, the emitter bounded above. And then uh, in this paper with the Cavalletti, where we proved the diagram of um, inequality, actually we proved it uh, for those two spaces uh, with any lower bound on the uh, Ricci and the upper bound on the, on the diameter. So I um, say for simplicity and uh, say to be short, uh, I just uh, discussed uh, the case of positive curvature because it's easier to uh, discuss, but actually you're right. You can do uh, things also in negative curvature once you have an upper bound on the, on, on, on the, on the, on the diameter. Yeah. Um and here there's a question in the chat uh, by Dagwan Chen. He's asking if the power one over six n plus four in the quantitative isometric, isometric inequality, if it's optimal. Uh, I don't guess so. I, 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 I don't think it is going to be optimal. Let me go back. But, uh, uh, but, it is, but I guess it is kind of asymptotically optimal. So let me, be, let me explain what I mean. So we have a power one over. Uh, so basically how I see this power is... Uh, a uh, perturbation of one over n, right? So this is when n uh, go to infinity, it is asymptotic to one over n. So I guess that the sharp power there is one over n. Um, surely with uh, our methods, uh, we, can, we cannot do better than one over n. Uh, and one over n is sharp for the uh, Berard Besson Gallo uh, statement. So let me go back to Berard Besson Gallo statement. So this one here, so the fact that uh, uh, if the ratio between, say, if, uh, um, if you have a set which uh, is close to achieving the equality in the Levigram of inequality with, with n or delta, then, the, uh, then the, the diameter of your space is close to pi. With, a, uh, with, with, with an error which is delta to power one over n. So this one over n is sharp and you can get it just by chopping uh, the ends of, of, of a sphere and you get uh, this uh, you get this power. Um, so I guess that the same power should appear in, uh, in the later, um, in the later uh, say statements. Uh, but in the proof, uh, we don't get it. So basically, because in, in the proof, uh, we, we have, say, we argue, we, we get some, in, instead of only working with integral estimates, uh, sometimes we do, we do Chebyshev, we get an infinity estimate, and there uh, you lose your sharpness. So, um, right. So I guess that, 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 that uh, the statement is, so I, 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 I guess that the right uh, power is, is one over n, but I don't know how. Yes, thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? But let's thank Andrea again. Thank you very much for thank this you. very nice talk. Thank you. Uh, and uh, let to check on my schedule. Let me just take one second. Um, we will uh, see each other next week at the same time uh, for a talk by Nuncia Gavitone, who will speak about uh, an eigenvalue problem for the Laplace operator in doubly connected domains. Uh, until then, have a great week and uh, be safe, everyone. And uh, thank you again, Andrea. It was great to see you and uh, great to hear you talk about this. Great to see you. Thanks for your question and bye bye. Have a good week. Bye bye. Thanks a lot. Uh, see you.